I was born in a suburb of Washington, D.C., in a place called Bethesda General, and I grew up till first and second grade. I grew up in a place called Rockville, Maryland. And then I, we moved to a place which was a huge suburbia where all the government workers were buying houses called Bowie. And I lived in a section of town which was kind of the the snotty part of town. All the houses were the same model because it was the most expensive model. It was only $25,000, but at the time, that was the most expensive model house, right? So we were the snotty ones, which I never really understood. And every single time a new school was built, while they're building this place, I got changed school districts. So I went to, you know, I don't know, eight or nine schools before I ever made it to high school. And I lived in the same house, which was kind of weird. I loved it in terms of my friends, in terms of, you know, what it had to offer me. Um, I didn't have such a good time in high school because I had really long hair and I didn't get high, and that pretty much eliminated everybody. All the short hair people go, ah, dumb, you know, dumb dope smoking hippie, and all the long hair people, you don't get high with us, ah, it's awful. And in the other last 20% were told by the other 80% to get away from me. So I didn't have such a good experience in high school. I loved to fish. So I, me and my friend Michael Snellings went fishing constantly, five days a week. My mother would drive us, you know, pick us up. Um, we would meet her at, at the end of the road where the lakes were. and We would walk down the lakes and you know, get picked up. I mean, we, we went fishing four or five days a week. We loved it. It was so much fun. One time, I've never told this story, there was a snapping turtle, and her shell was this big around. She was huge, and she was in there laying eggs, which we did not understand. All this dirt was, you know, she was shuffling it around, and we put a stick in about that big around and shoved it in the hole. She grabbed onto her teeth, and we dragged her out, hissing, mad. I didn't understand. But we'd never seen an animal like this. It was really cool. I, that was just a sideline, you know. One time, a buck came running out to get water in the morning, really early in the morning, and my dog took off after it. It went through brambles that were impassable, even if you had a machete, and it went through them at the speed of a freight train. It sounded like a freight train. I'd never heard anything like it in my life. And then we caught big fish, and we saw snakes, you know. It was just, it was literally like being in Montana, but you were in Maryland. It was cool. So for me, music was a big part of my childhood when I was an adolescent. Um, my family was the one that went Christmas caroling. My, my father had a piano in the... Um, living room, but my mother used to play acoustic nylon string guitar and sing folk songs. The fox went out on a chase one night. It's beautiful, and we, and we loved it. Um, I was more touched by that than I was by the Christmas carols. Um, but there was always music in the house. You know, my father loved Beethoven's Ninth Symphony and a bunch of other stuff. He played piano all the time. He played the same song over and over again at the piano, which I thought was interesting. But one day my mother came home and she hands me this record. And they were not CDs or cassette tapes, but a record, you know. And there are four guys on the record with long hair, which we weren't allowed to have, and black turtleneck sh shirts. And she goes, these guys are going to be huge. And it was Meet the Beatles. My brother brings home a record. He said, these, these guys are huge in England. They're going to be huge in America. It was a black guy with two eyes on his shirt and two white guys with froze, just like the black guy in the middle. And I opened the, sacrilegiously, I opened the record and I listened to the whole thing. By the time I got to Are You Experienced, the Hendrix record at the end, I couldn't talk. I had just heard something that changed my life. My brother forgave me for taking the record out, you know, and listening to it. But, I, you know, the backwards guitar and our experience, I was like, what in God's name? And I 
did get inspired to play guitar by listening to that music. And the first tune I learned, other than Proud Mary, which I played on the bass, was Day Tripper on the acoustic guitar, which was kind of a hard lick to learn. Right? But that's what I started with. It didn't bother me at all. I thought it was a cool lick. Um, yeah, so I started on nylon string guitar and got an electric guitar and never went back. You know, I loved it. Look, I was a B student. I was the guy who never did his homework but studied for the test sitting outside on the floor right before class, you know. Um, I had a B average. It was all right. It wasn't good enough grades to go to the schools I wanted to go to, but I wasn't that interested. I was interested in, I had a drafting class taught me how to draw the parts on this guitar. This is a 1985 guitar, number five. This is the first, you know, the earliest one, you know, you would possibly want. Um, it's in our archives. And so I was able to draw you know, the tuning peg parts or the neck or the inlays or the body shape or the carve or, you know, where the bridge went, how the bridge was made or whatever it was. I'd learned that in drafting class. I enjoyed that. That was just part of my journey, that's all. It was not... Look, I certainly didn't enjoy history. It was just a memory class. You know, I didn't have a history memory. I, you know, that was painful. Um, what wasn't painful was you know, dreaming about making guitars, or I, I actually, in my bedroom, learned this. The vibrato. That took a long time to learn how to do. I got a job repairing guitars at Washington Music Center, and it taught me a huge amount. You know, how, how to level frets, how to do refrets, how to cut nuts, how to put in pickups, how to move bridges, how to glue on broken headstocks. You name it, I was doing it. And when I went to St. Mary's College, I started an independent study project to build a guitar in the basement of the art building. And the teacher looked at this bag of wood. He goes, if you can turn that into a guitar, I'll grade it and you get four credits. I got an A on it, which I thought was cool. I built it in tears because my girlfriend had left me. And I, my heart was broken, and it had nothing to do with the guitar. The guitar part was awesome, but my heart had been broken. I mean, I, she didn't break it, I broke it. But that's an adult version of it. At the time, I was in a lot of pain. So for me, I did it, I built that guitar in a ridiculous amount of pain. She, you know, I had fallen in love and she was not going to be with me. Oh, that didn't feel good. And my first experience with that, that hurt. But I built the guitar and that was fun. I told people that it was what I was going to do for a living. And I went to my friend, I was going to quit college a year and a half in, and I was going to be a guitar maker, go to Annapolis and have a shop. And I asked him what he thought. It was my friend Alan Flincham, and he said, you might have a chance, maybe. You might, you might be able to do it. We're still friends, I, I, do, I adore Alan. Um, but he was the only one who took it seriously. My father kind of disowned me for doing it. My mother was giving me money and trying to help me out. I remember my, was I was leaving the house and like the, I had rented a van and it was packed up with all my stuff. I was headed for Annapolis to go start my shop. And he said, well, if I can help you, let me know. I went, wait a minute. Whoa, whoa. You tried to fight me the entire time and now on my way out the door, you want to help me? He goes, well, I tried to stop you. I couldn't, so I guess I'll help you. I was like, no, I don't think so. But I did take him up on it later. I came back and asked for his help. We would start in the shop at noon and work till seven. About a third size of this room. I slept in it. I, my dresser was in there. My clothes were in there. My workshop was in there. I would wipe the chips off my bed at night because the router would spit them onto my bed before I was cutting pickup holes out. I was magic times. The thing that was beautiful about it was that nobody could tell me what to do. I had to figure out how to rely on what I believed. It's almost like going fishing alone. There's nobody telling you where to put the lure every day, you know. The thing that's magic about this place 
is that I let people have their head. I don't tell them exactly what to do. I'll push on them and fight for my position. But mostly I do it as a teacher, not as a boss. You know, I, and I don't try to throw my weight around no matter what you all say we're doing it this way. It's not my way. Because then you have somebody who just lost their mojo. They lost their thought process. They lost their own thing. You know, we've got somebody from PRS in the room behind you, and I may disagree with him, push on him, but it's his decision. I'm not trying to make his decisions for him. That's, that's not a good way to go. But in that shop, it was my decision. And that's a good way to start because I didn't know that I believed in what I thought. Yeah, we were learning how to make guitars. One month would be all about making pickups, and one month would be all about making a guitar, and another month it were lots of repairs. What was interesting, it was almost driven by God. The months I had all these repairs, I didn't have any guitars to make. The month that I had a guitar to make, there were no repairs. It was literally, the decks were cleared by this, by the force be with you or whatever you want to call it, you know. Everything changed one little piece at a time. This headstock changed at one time. The way the neck shape was changed at one time. The birds changed at one time. The pickups, the rotary switch, all this stuff all happened at separate times. Even the way the, the original jack only had two screws. I mean, the back plates weren't exactly that shape, but they were close. I, hey, look, I didn't have plastic, so I'd buy picture frames made out of plastic, and I would draw on top of the picture frame the shape I want, and I would cut to the line, and I would file it to get it in the size and spray the back black so it would be black. I, you know, I was cutting them out with my teeth. I didn't have a, I didn't have, you know, a CNC machine and black plastic to order from Stumac or, or Luther's Mercantile. That's not the way it went. Well, if you wanted a guitar, I would take a deposit. And the rule was, if you didn't fall in love with it, I'd give you your money back. And then sometimes, if I got an order from Carlos Santana, I wouldn't even take a deposit because it was Carlos, right? So I would wait until um, it was done. And if he fell in love with it, he goes, you, you mean like it, right? I said, no, if you don't fall in love with it, he goes, under that deal, I'll do it. So unless he fell in love with it, he didn't have to buy it. That was the only deal. If I didn't make that deal, I had no order. It was over. Done. I mean, that's at the time, that was me trying to make sure that they gave me a chance. Well, in 1985, we started the company. I had taken orders from 84 November. And, you know, by April, we had the company started. Good evening, and welcome once again to Crabtown, USA. Tonight, we'll give you a little bit of information on St. Patrick's Day. We'll show you where the finest electric guitar in the United States of America is made on West Street. We'll also show you the latest in vending machines. So stay with us, and we'll be right back. Annapolis achieves its share of national claim in many areas, from sailors in their world-class racing yachts to actors who play parts in top-ranking films. In the area of music, we have exceptional talent, from world-class guitarist Charlie Bird to our most recent success story, Starpoint, a band steadily moving into the class of superstars. In this musical scene comes Paul Reed Smith, who now produces, undoubtedly, the most sought-after electric guitar in the world. He started his trade in a basement at St. Mary's College and opened a shop on the third floor of this building on West Street. Now, however, he runs a factory off of Chinkaman Round Road that produces almost 200 of his masterpieces each month. Paul is also a superb musician whose passion for playing is reflected every time he takes to the stage. Crabtown now invites you to sit back, relax, and enjoy a musical tour of yet another Annapolis success story. So after I started playing guitar, it just started to become very obvious to me that I wanted to build it's not explainable, it's just true. Uh, haven't you ever had a, a hunch that you knew something and you, but you uh, didn't know why you knew it? Yeah. I had $300,000 of the orders, and once I filled them, the scary part was would I get a reorder? 
wasn't fulfilling the orders was hard enough. We worked tirelessly and started shipping guitars in August, and this was April, right? And we got them out, and the scary part was, what was I going to get a reorder? And because the money was draining out of the account, but the check started to come in. But if I didn't get a reorder, it would have just died. And, but we got a reorder. The market gave us permission to be in the market. That's what we call our rent here. Did the market, get, the market give us permission? We cut all the necks and bodies out of large mahogany lumber. Um, the necks are cut out of 12 quarter mahogany lumber up in the rack and the bodies are cut out of 10 quarter and 8 quarter mahogany lumber that you see here on the floor. Um, curly maple tops come out of 4 quarter lumber which we buy here in the States. Uh, you can see the curls in the side of the rough lumber right here. There were a lot of skilled people that we hooked up with. Um, machinists, inlay people, people to make the parts, people to make tuning pegs. but. Most of the people who worked in the factory wanted to be join something that turned nothing into something. So we trained them because there was no other guitar maker. And, and it would have been worse because then they would have already done it their way and I wanted it done my way. Um, I, you know, I had a real clear idea of how I wanted the guitars made. And I still fight for that every day. It's still hard. The world wants you to do it their way, and it's hard to push back and go, no, we're going to do it this way. So to me, it's almost easier to train from scratch than to undo somebody else. I heard of Ted McCarty in the patent office. If you went through all the patents at the time, it wasn't electronic, it was paper. And the patents that I had seen on my repair bench were either by Leo Fender or Ted McCarty. And Ted McCarty was the Gibson Guitar Corporation in Kalamazoo, Michigan. I didn't know who he was, but his name kept coming up in patents I'd seen on my bench. There were hundreds of patents, most of them I'd never seen. But the ones from Leo Fender and Ted McCarty, most of them I'd seen. Clay Evans, who was then our president, said, call him. And I said, I can't do that. He says, call him. I said, I can't do this. Pick up the phone and dial him. So I did, and he picked up the phone. And you know, the rest is history. Um, I asked him if he would fly to see us. He said, I can't fly. He said, I have dislocated retinas. I was early on in dislocated retina, and the la they had the laser too hot when they were just doing it, and it burnt holes in my retina, and I have no... I only had peripheral vision. Turns out he could fly, but at the time he wasn't going to fly to see some new kid on the phone with him. I wanted to hire him as a consultant. He said, you can come here. I'll consult with you. So we did that. That worked out. Ted was more of a teacher of how it was there at Gibson, not how it was going to be for us. You know, how did you glue the frets in? How did you cut the necks? How did you glue the tops on? How did you do this? How did you do that? He was very informative about how it was done. I had only guesses, but he had facts. And you can tell if somebody's lying because they tell the story different every time. But if you tell the story the same exactly every time, it's the truth. And he never, he never varied the story, never varied a syllable. For me, I have to look backwards at why these magic single coil guitars sound like they do. For me, I have to look backwards at why these magic humbuckers sound like they do. For these, what magic neck shapes. And you learn from those moments in history and then incorporate what you can in the future. There's a story about Mike Tyson that he was one of the most studied watching film of fights of anybody. And he would use that information about how he, you know, he, he would go about it. Um, it didn't hurt that when the other fighter said he hit him, it felt like a truck had hit him. Um, <laughs> um, but uh, for me, I, I'm looking at all the film. I'm looking at what happened in the past to be able to understand how to go forward. Most recently, with the Silver Sky and the 594, it's given me a really good idea how to move forward. And there's a new product that we're, it's finalized, 
and I think it's a way to go forward um, in a new way, not an old way. So it's a combination of learning the past. Look, guitar makers don't get good till they're my age. If you go study Stradivari or any of these people, they got really good about my age. It's not like an athlete that you know matures at 28. You know, I, it was a reflection. I mean, this guitar was made a long time ago, and it looks very similar to what we make now, but there's been so many updates. You know, we're trying to make an instrument that if you bought it, it will last you a lifetime. And you can instantly go play, do a recording session or a gig with it without any repairman getting their hands on it. That would be the idea. In an American cartoon show, The Jetsons, have you ever heard of that? They had a business called Coswell's Cogs, and you would put the metal in one end and the cogs would come out the other. Now, that would be the way to do it, but Coswell's Cogs, not possible. You know, we've got robots spraying the guitars now, but to get the robots to do the fine handwork, we're not there. And so it is a combination of machine work and handwork, a beautiful combination. I don't know where the motivation comes from. It's there. I love to learn. I enjoy guitars. A lot of these guitar players, they, it'll happen when they're young. They, they run across some experience with a guitar, and that's it. It's written on their bones, and they're off to the races. They know that's what they're going to do the rest of their lives. You know, I, Joe Walsh is playing at as high a level as he ever played right now. And... If you haven't seen Jimmy Herring play, he's playing at an extraordinary level. Carlos is on fire right now. Uh, Mark Tremonti practices so much, he's wearing the frets on his guitars out just from practicing. You know, if, anytime you see Eric Johnson, he's got a guitar and he's playing, you know. The, it's, it's in their bones. It, they love it. Um, I very often would catch a guitar player after doing a trade show up in their room for a couple hours practicing. I saw Eric Johnson start practicing the second he got into the dressing room after he got off the stage. I mean, come on. He, he, but the, the, the sound that's coming out of his hands bring the hair on your arms up. He knows what he's got his hand, hands around. It's ridiculous. I think it's incredibly important that I'm a musician, but Ted McCarty and Leo Fender did not play guitar. so. Two of the icons of our business interviewed artists to figure out what to do. I interview artists and play. I don't know how they did it without it. I, I don't know how to be a magic violin maker without playing violin. It just doesn't make sense to me. Um, from my point of view, you know, Guadagnini and Stradivari and Amati and all these people must have played violin. It's just, it just seems like a requirement. Um, it just so happens that this is the violin of our time. You know, those that was at the time in England. If Paganini showed up at the docks, the whole London would go down to greet this rock star. You know, now it you know it was Deep Purple. Now you know, I, I don't think anybody meets John Mayer at the airport anymore. I think those days are gone. But at the time, the royalty would buy the violins and lend them to the pauper musicians. To you know, that was the way. And I still think there's merit in the rich people buying extraordinary instruments and lending them to the uh, young up and coming whip whippersnappers, you know. It is continuous improvement. And I have, I've been working in my studio, you know, working with my kids, working with my grandchildren, working with, you know, my relationship with my wife, working here at PRS on the guitars the amplifiers, all the stuff. It's a big ship and it's hard to turn. But the part I love is that people put their hearts into it and they put their lives into it and the positive is way greater than the negative. You don't put 450 people in a building. and You know what they start doing? They start getting married and having babies. I, You know, that's, just, that's unbelievable to me. Um... I think it's uh, beautiful what goes on here. Look, the reason I'm here is for two reasons. One, it gives me an ability to be good at what I'm good at. Two, I feel committed to the people here not to let them down. If they're going to be here, I don't want to let them down. I could probably make more money in a small shop building one-off guitars. 
I don't want to do it. I'd rather have some of this stuff spread around. I like the people here. I think the people here are good-hearted. I think that they care about what they do. I think they feel motivated to make the place better. Have I given a lot of thought to the legacy of Pyrrhus? Yes. Do I have an answer? No. Um, I'm teaching a lot. At some point, I'll just let go. We'll see what happens. Um, I mean, Leo Fender let go at one point. You know, Ted McCarty let go at one point. Um, I'll let go at some point. I mean, death's going to force me to let go. Um, I don't want to be that person. I've made a promise to my grandchildren that I'm going to teach them a lot, and so that's coming. Um, look, they're not going to talk about a guitar maker at my funeral. They're going to talk about father. They're going to talk about husband. They're going to talk about grandfather. They're going to talk about, you know, hopefully, I want to, what, what I want written on my gravestone is good family member. I don't want, you know, a guitar maker written on the gravestone. I don't know what's going to happen. You can't you can't control what you can't control. But right now I'm I'm focused on trying to give as much back as I can. They actually want me to do something about writing all this crap down. I call them Paulisms, the little sayings that I have. You know, we'll see if there's it's worth ink on the paper. We'll see. What I care about is the well-being of my family in this place, that I do care about.